Welcome to Penn Arts and Sciences sixth annual Penn Grad Talks. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Nora Lewis, Vice Dean for Professional and Liberal Education in the School of Arts and Sciences. Today is the fourth and final installment of our four day series of talks. Yesterday, we heard from students in the natural sciences, and today we'll hear from graduate students in the professional master's programs in the College of Liberal and Professional Studies. The College of Liberal and Professional Studies, or LPS for short, has been extending a Penn Arts and Sciences education to working adults and professional audiences for 130 years. The nine professional master's degrees in LPS reflect the range of our faculty's scholarship across the humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences. Together, the programs enroll a thousand individuals each year who come to Penn from our local community, across the US and around the world. Today's presentations will give you a taste of some of the diverse fields of study and amazing students represented in arts and sciences professional master's programs. Our speakers today are Elise Jacobson from the Master of Liberal Arts, Colin Cather from the Master of Public Administration and Public Health Programs, Nikisha Renee Jones from the Master of Behavioral and Decision Sciences, Yan Song Lee from the Master of Environmental Studies, and Emily Kurtayan from the Master of Chemical Sciences. I encourage you to watch each of the five talks and to click on the link below to cast your own vote for the Audience Choice Award. One winner across the four categories will receive a $500 prize. You can also visit sas.upenn.edu for voting information and to view the talks from earlier this week. Lastly, I want to add my sincere gratitude to all of this week's speakers. Your talks have highlighted the important role graduate students play in the scholarship that sustains Penn Arts and Sciences. Enjoy the talks. Material culture has been an integral part of the human experience throughout history. We live our lives surrounded by such things, particularly in a city like Philly, which with so much historic art and architecture, and we often take for granted how we perceive these things. In reality, there is no single perspective through which art and history can be understood. Both art and heritage are often manipulated by state and non-state actors to craft narratives that delineate cultural boundaries, othering minorities and opposing groups to achieve their goals. By examining such instances of narrative construction, we're able to understand the role of art and heritage in crafting identity and assigning power. The three cases I will examine are Nazi art policy, the site of Pravahir in Thailand and Cambodia, and the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas. Nazi art policy evolved out of an existing philosophy of degeneracy, drawing on theorists like Max Nordau and Paul Schultz-Nomberg who critiqued modernism and modern art as symptomatic of societal degeneracy. They linked art that they saw as moral lunacy with a rhetoric of disease and decay, as pictured here in Paul schultz Nomberg's book, comparing images from modern art with patients with physical deformities. Hitler used this narrative to begin a campaign of dehumanization against those he wished to scapegoat, the pinnacle of which was the Degenerate Art Show in 1937. The Degenerate Art Show was comprised of works of art that had been confiscated from museums around Germany that were not felt to fit the true German ideal. They were displayed haphazardly, interwoven with uh, Nazi slogans, derogatory quotes, quotes mocking the art and the artists, quotes from Hitler himself, all intended as a very didactic experience to visitors, leaving them with little doubt as to what they were to think of the art that they were seeing. By describing the artists in the Degenerate Art Exhibition with such a violent rhetoric, Hitler was able to undermine their ability to connect with German people and frame them not as individuals worthy of respect or compassion, but rather as a blight on society that needed to be condemned and eradicated. The role of heritage between Thailand and Cambodia over the site of Pravahir is not as the actions of a single dictatorial regime, but rather multiple actors seeking to co-opt heritage in their own narrative construction. 
The site of Pravihir is situated in the Dangrek mountain range between Thailand and Cambodia, in a region that has had a long history of conflict. In 1907, French colonial influence came in and made Cambodia a protectorate and drew up a border that they essentially forced the Siamese people, now the nation of Thailand, to sign. And since then, both nations have felt a sense of ownership over this site. On the part of Thailand, uh, the site has become key in their rhetoric of reclaiming territory that was lost in the demarcation of the border. Sparked into action by Cambodia's proposal of the site, the UNESCO World Heritage List in 2007, groups like the People's Alliance for Democracy, a, national, a Thai nationalist group, raised significant backlash against the action, particularly seeing that the Thai government had actually signed off on the proposal. They framed this support of Cambodia as a betrayal of the Thai people, inflaming the rhetoric and uh, mobilizing at the site to incite military action. They successfully inflamed the rhetoric to the point that they were able to call for a vote of no confidence in the prime minister and to force the foreign minister to resign, framed as a traitor to the Thai people. In Cambodia, Prime Minister Hun Sen similarly capitalized on the site as a symbol, but rather than for destabilization, he used it to consolidate his power. The perceived aggression of Thailand as the yellow shirts mobilized at the site allowed Hun Sen and his regime to build up anti-Thai sentiments within Cambodia and to frame their actions as an unjustified attack on Cambodian identity. They linked imagery of Pravihir with imagery of Angkor Wat pictured here on the Cambodian flag, a site of huge significance which lent Pravihir similar importance through the connection. Hun Sen and his allies framed the Thai as other and as a dangerous threat to the Cambodian people, and Prava here came to perfectly encapsulate this cultural demarcation, both as a representation of Thai violence and of Cambodian nationalism. The Bamiyan Buddhas were destroyed by the Taliban in 2001, a highly visible act of destruction that was effectively orchestrated to drive home their ideological goals on a number of levels. Within the borders of Afghanistan, it served to demonstrate who they felt should be a part of the state they were trying to construct. In addition to Buddhists, the statues were very important to the Hazaras, an ethnic community in the Bamiyan Valley. Their long history in the valley meant that the Hazara people had a great love for the statues and that the statues had a significant role in their folklore, and thus the destruction of the statues demonstrated their lack of worth in the eyes of the Taliban. The Hazaras practiced the Shia school of Islam, which was seen as heretical, and thus they were not worthy of respect or consideration. In addition to domestically, they, this action also served to drive home the discrepancy between the domestic community and the international community, as offers of aid from organizations like UNESCO were framed as callous in the face of the suffering of the Afghan people. And this narrative of alienation from the West is goes both ways. Pictured here are two maps, one of UNESCO's all sites inscribed on the World Heritage List, and the other of all sites on the World Heritage List in danger. The Middle East as a region is home to just 7% of sites on the World Heritage List, but is home to 38% of sites on the list in danger. This discrepancy demonstrates the way that the international heritage community essentializes the discussion of heritage within the Middle East, portraying it as a region that is unable and unwilling to protect their own patrimony and in need of Western expertise to come in and preserve it. The diversity of human experience is such that heritage cannot be all things to all people. It's constantly being framed and reframed, written into narratives of victory and defeat. And this is natural. As humans, we seek out patterns and create stories that aid in our understanding of the world. However, as these narratives are constructed, it's inevitable that certain perspectives are prioritized over others. And it's important that we consider whose voices are being silenced. In reality, it isn't that these objects and these places have inherent value, but these narratives that are built that give those places value, and that value is what is used as a weapon of othering against minorities and others. It is important for us to consider the narratives that shape our own experiences with heritage and our interactions with art. We must examine how our perceptions are reinforcing cultural boundaries and how we are contributing to the formation of identity and power. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. If after this talk I chose to walk across the street to the hospital to donate blood, I wouldn't be allowed to. Say I worked at a religious organization, and when I walked into work tomorrow, my boss decided to fire me at the door. She would be well within her right to do so. If I decided this summer to go out and foster a child in the city of Philadelphia, I would have to be very careful with which agency I chose. In the year 2022, LGBT people are still second-class citizens in the United States of America. Queer, gay men are not allowed to donate blood. Queer individuals are being increasingly fired under what's known as the ministerial exception. And in July 2021, in Fulton v. the City of Philadelphia, the Supreme Court enacted a dangerous precedent that religious foster and adoption agencies do not have to serve same-sex couples. In that same year, roughly 400,000 kids were shuffled in and out and around the foster care system, but the Catholic Social Services and those like them were more concerned with the sexual orientation of a prospective parent than they were with actually placing a child in a home. I want to discuss a couple more Supreme Court cases with you. Obergefell v. Hodges in 2015 ruled that same-sex marriage is the law of the land. Two years later, Pavon v. Smith said that two same-sex parents could be listed on a child's birth certificate, provided that they were married. 2015 and 2017. It was only within the past seven years that same-sex couples have been allowed to marry at a national level. And it's only been within five years that they've been allowed to be on a child's birth certificate together. That's pretty damn recent. And while all of these rulings may purport that gay people have equal legal footing in the United States, the reality couldn't be more convoluted. And given the recent Fulton ruling, I'm a little worried about what could happen now. The gay community is no stranger to legalized discrimination, but what's next on the horizon is a bit more difficult for us to navigate socially, culturally, and legally. Because really, not many of us have yet, and that's parenting. As many are aware, there are three main ways two men or two women, or anyone who's not straight for that matter, can have children, besides the old-fashioned method, of course. And those ways are surrogacy and foster care slash adoption. Surrogacy is a wonderful option, but the average cost is, get this, between $100,000 and $150,000 for one pregnancy. And that's if everything goes well. Can't afford that? Well, most of us can't, so let's move on to the next option. Foster care and adoption are surely more affordable, albeit not free, uh, but present a tricky set of legal, social, and financial hurdles for couples to endure. This isn't just a problem for potential parents. Oh no, it's also a problem for the kids who need homes. Children who age out of foster care and who are never adopted have a significantly higher chance of drug addiction, homelessness, and overall a lessened quality of life compared to their children who are adopted. This is known. What's also known is that for same-sex parents, having children greatly increases their quality of life as well. Having kids gives them a sense of purpose, increases generational wealth, and provides legal protections in the case of some traumatic event. So what's the holdup? This all sounds great. Well, it's hard. For those for whom surrogacy is within their budget, while the process might be less stressful in some ways, they still face a tenuous medical journey and inescapable legal fees, on top of that hefty price tag that I mentioned earlier. For foster parents, if you're lucky enough to find an agency that will work with you, you risk losing your placement at any time, often seemingly at a whim, to a birth parent who, more often than not, is simply not fit to be a parent. For adoptive parents, if you make it through the several year waiting period and are chosen for placement, you better wish upon a star that you live in a state where second parent adoption or the process of duly adopting a child when one parent is not biological is legal. As it currently stands, 22 states do not permit this for same sex couples. Same sex couples on average make more money than their heterosexual counterparts and children of same sex couples have been clinically proven to be just as well adjusted as children of straight parents. Some studies even suggest better adjusted. The US Census even says that same-sex couple households are on the rise in the United States and increasingly becoming more interested in raising kids. We're the obvious choice here, right? So why does it seem like we have the short end of the stick? Well, I don't have a good answer for you then, like most things for us, that's just kind of how it is. And as most of us are aware, gay marriage didn't solve everything clearly. Legally, we're very new to this whole marriage thing. We're also pretty new to parenting. And while that's great, that's also the problem. 
Societally, we've advanced to the point where the majority of the country accepts us now, but the law is still catching up. And ultimately, while the parents are suffering, the real victims here are the hundreds of thousands of kids just waiting for a home. We need to modernize this process because while parenting is undoubtedly an issue of gay rights, the paths to parenthood for all people operate under slow and efficient and downright archaic architecture. The failure to modernize the parenting system is causing children to miss placements and for prospective parents to lose hope. Same-sex cohabitating households are arguably the fastest growing market of potential parents to foster children at high rates. I mean, there are about 500,000 same-sex cohabitating households in the US, and there are about 400,000 children in foster care. I don't know about you, but those numbers kind of match up. I mean, hypothetically, subtract the parents who, who choose the surrogacy route, and we still have more than one household for every potential child in foster care. And the reason these kids remain without home? Legal shrapnel from a system that was built to discriminate and is still fighting to be remedied. I ask you all to take a look at the cards that I handed out at the beginning of my presentation. Those of you watching online, I suggest you visit www.adoptuskids.org to follow along. What you hold in your hands are all real foster and adoption profiles from children and teens around the United States, all in desperate need of family placement at this very moment. Whomever's card has Isaac, he does very well in science class, and more than anything, he really just wants to spend Thanksgiving with the family this year. Eight-year-old Raymond's dream is to visit the North Pole to scope out Santa's toy shop. Nancy is on track to graduate high school early and start college in a year. And Anthony and Alex are two Texas brothers who are inseparable and love to read books. Every single kid on those pieces of paper in your hands is looking for a family. Many same-sex couples, just like Frankie, BJ, and little Milo up here, just want an equal shot at the family dream and will do whatever they can to get there. I mean, this photo has the power to show you how much having a family has changed their life. The chance to love and share life's most precious moments with children and to create a strong unit and lineage that could finally place gay parents on a more equal footing with their straight counterparts. This all has the potential to be life-changing, and I promise you that in a perfect world, we could solve this problem today if we wanted to. Thank you. I would like to begin today with a spoken word piece that I wrote for this, for this occasion. <laughs> if everyone else is the problem, then the problem can't be me. One finger forward, three pointing back, living in a world of paradoxology. Privilege blends with power, coinciding with patriarchy. Us against them mentality, stemming from white supremacy, globalized and localized, paints black, brown, yellow, red as monstrosities exploiting bodies for capitalism, then blaming it on manifest destiny. Trail of tears longer than settler colonialism will ever be. The United States never united for everybody. Constitution written for the dominant majority. Who's in the seats of power? Who's still waiting for their turn superfluously? Empty promises that the world to rectify peacefully. We don't need equality. There is never an even playing field from the beginning. We need equity, respectfully. Thank you. So equity starts from the understanding that our world is imbalanced. That some people are treated more humanely than others, and that some people have access to what they need, but not everybody. So let's imagine this with an example of shoes. Let's say everyone needs a pair of shoes, but only some people get those shoes depending on their identity. And that becomes a problem in society. One approach to solving that problem would be through equality, where we give everyone the same amount of the same shoe. But equality doesn't differentiate between individual needs. Equity, on the other hand, functions to adjust those imbalances by customizing the shoe to be contextualized by their identity. So now we have different shoes for different people. Equity builds on the idea of equality, but it's ultimately leading towards the creation of justice. And justice is the removal of those systems to begin with, where we can build systems that make personally designed shoes for everyone, with, for example, equitable access to a cobbler. The whole point of equity is to create societal change that will foster every life being valued equally. In my work as an equity consultant, 
I assist other organizations and people to get more equitable outcomes and behaviors. And over the course of many years, I've noticed the same problems over and over with how people treat one another. I've delineated the problem into two paths. The first being interpersonal, meaning we want to treat people with value. The second being social emotional, meaning everyone should have their needs met. In reality, every moment of every day, people are being mistreated. Lives are expended unnecessarily. This is what inspired me as a grassroots mobilizer to go into my studies at Penn in order to create a connection between behavioral and neuroscience. When I used to organize hundreds of people to protest and advocate for the protection of human equity, I noticed that the problems we're arguing about today are the same problems that have existed for centuries and that we have been combating for year after year. We're simply not getting the results that people want or need for the betterment of humanity. And the problem is not the activists. It's actually somewhere in the social structures. So I'd like to tell you a different way that we can solve this within the disciplines of science. Let's start with behavioral science. So the choices that we make are usually in the notion of bounded rationality, which basically says that we have limitations in how we go about making decisions, such as complexity, time, or our cognitive ability. And it starts to set the foundation for us to explore why human decision making is fallible which leads us to the idea of biases and heuristics. And these terms explain cognitive shortcuts that we use to reduce complexity in judgment. Heuristics are different categories of shortcuts, and sometimes they lead to errors in judgment. But when those errors become systemic, they lead to being biases. And biases cause inappropriate treatment. Oftentimes, when we make fast, unconscious decisions, we can consider that coming out of system one thinking. And then slower, more deliberate decisions tend to come from system two. But the main point in all of these is that humans, by nature, typically don't have a fully developed analysis when they make a decision about a person. So let's look into the neuroscience. When we delve into the mind, we can start with the triune brain theory. Triune brain theory postulates that we have one mind with three brains that have evolved over time. Usually in the lower red region, which is called the brain stem, it goes to the blue region or the limbic system, and then the green region or the prefrontal lobe. The brain stem is colloquially known as the reptile brain because our instincts emerge from there. <laughs> Over time though, the brain has matured to become more complex in decision making and the green lobe is colloquially known as the thinking brain. Once information enters the brain, it routes through these regions. And from there, we direct our movements to the motor cortex, which is traditionally viewed as the final output. So let's put these together in an example. Let's imagine that a person is asked to complete some math where they look at a number and determine if it's greater than or less than five. So the person sees a number on the computer screen, the number three, starts processing the sensory information in their limbic system, moves into the cortex to logically assess the equation, and then flows through the motor cortex to result in some movement, which is the striking of the keyboard with an answer. Another way of looking at this is through these steps shown sequentially. Stimuli go into our emotional processing, which inform our beliefs and then thoughts and then results in a behavior. But what happens when that stimuli is a human? We automatically start judging and assessing them to make sense of our world. Ultimately, as a result of our automatic and distorted mental processes, we end up with inequitable behaviors. These behaviors are then reinforced through our social structures to define a status quo. Unfortunately, this is the missing link in traditional equity work because it doesn't look underneath the mind and body to find the underlying motives that cause the behavior. At the beginning of my talk, I also presented you with a cognitive bias, just to see if you're paying attention. But I gave you a false dichotomy, which is that behavioral science solves one end of the problem and neuroscience solves another end of the problem. But in practice, both of these sciences work together, combining these pieces to form our ideologies. The secret sauce is once you understand that our ideologies come from flawed mental systems, you can understand why we have flawed social systems. All of our interpersonal and social systems are human made. It's all a social construct. And these structures normally seem very overwhelming to try and address, but we can actually change the structures by changing the way our mind and body perceive the world. Here are a list of ways that we can change ourselves for the betterment of humanity. We're not gonna talk about them all today, but in reference, these are things we can do on our own or in a collective group of people. So you have a choice in the matter. You can become a tool for your mind and body, or in reality, we can acknowledge that we hold both the problem inside 
and the solution outside. It's a beautiful paradigm. We can use science as a tool to create more equitable behaviors and therefore more equitable social structures. Thank you. Hello everyone, and thank you for the introduction. Today I want to talk to you about a circular economy. But first I want to show you this picture. This is a canal in Amsterdam, and for most people it is dirty and dingy, and something you probably don't want to get your hands into. But for circular economy entrepreneurs, this represents a huge opportunity to not only improve our own environmental sustainability, but also help to create social and economic value. But what is a circular economy? Unlike our current linear economic system that is based on the extraction of natural resources, a circular economic system is regenerative by design and it is based on a few principles. First, it must help us eliminate all waste and pollution. Second, it needs to circulate our product, materials, and resources. And finally, and most importantly, it needs to help regenerate nature. So today I want to take you on a journey with me as we travel through Amsterdam and learn the stories of three local businesses as they embody the ideals of a circular economy and learn how we can also improve our own system with circular economy. So let's first start with Plastic Wheel, the world's very first plastic fishing company that set out to clean up the river that we just saw by turning trash collecting into one of my absolute favorite tourist boat attractions. And before we set sail, the first thing that we we'll notice is that our boat is made almost completely from recycled pet balls. And you can even see the individual caps decorating the floor of our boat. And as we travel through the canals, using our hands and fishing net to collect any garbage that we come across, we're also treated with beautiful scenery and rich local history. All the garbage that we collect will later be separated into recyclable pet balls that will be used to manufacture even more plastic fishing boats and their new circular furniture. All the rest will be diverted to local waste management facilities. And in the year 2019, the company have claimed that they have motivated more than 17,000 people, nearly 18,000 people, to partake in this kind of activity and have rescued more than 40,000 pet balls. And that's me, and as you can see, I was really enjoying it. But it's really more than just a boat ride that's putting that smile on my face. It is also a sense of fulfillment, as people thank us for taking care of the local environment. And the company really tries to push for this social dimension by hosting public plastic fishing events that is now so popular, it is now part of the city culture. They also collaborate with schools and engage with students to teach them about sustainability and circular economy. And as we travel through the streets of Amsterdam, one thing we cannot fail to notice is just how many bikes there are in Amsterdam. They are really everywhere. Which is great because it's considered to be a very sustainable transportation method. Yet in Amsterdam, this has become a problem. Due to a variety of reasons, maybe people relocate or because of theft, it is estimated that one million bicycles are being thrown away in Amsterdam every year. To solve this problem, a company called Rose Bike created their own circular value chain. By taking in abandoned bicycles and reworking their parts and materials, they are able to create new bicycles out of the old ones. And so far, they have achieved 30% circularity, and they, hope, uh, they also help the local bike sharing fleet to achieve 70% circularity. And in 2016, they claim to have saved over 20 tons of raw materials. But it's really more than just materials and resources that they are trying to save, it's also the people. With the onset of AIs and the offshoring of, many, uh, of manufacturing jobs, a lot of people are left in poor economic and employment conditions. So to help them, Rosby created their own fair factory. It is a social factory where people can come in to be educated and trained on how to become a bicycle smith, while also they are providing economic career development lessons for these people so they can see better employment in the future. And finally, as we bug through the streets, you can often see these structures like these uh, decorating Amsterdam. They are called warm hotels, and they are communal composting eco-furnitures created by a company called Le Compostier. And they help the city to reduce food waste and increase public awareness around the issue of food waste. 
Meanwhile, they also play a cru crucial um, role in creating a nutrient cellular economy because all the food that goes into them become a compost that will later fuel the local community and rooftop gardens. And really, this is just another wonderful way to reestablish the kind of connection once, be uh, once existed between people and nature. So as we see from these, uh, these examples, companies are trying to become more circular, and by doing so, they not only improve their own environmental sustainability, but also help to create a vibrant economy and prosperous society. So how can we use circular economy to improve our own system? To answer this question, I looked at the bike sharing services in China. Since it was introduced in 2016, it has really, really taken off, and it is considered to be a very sustainable transportation method. Yet, similar to Amsterdam, a lot of bikes are eventually abandoned in so-called bicycle graveyards due to limited circularity rates. So my current research really tries to understand what kind of reduction in environmental impact we can gain if we adopt a circular strategy, and I'm very happy to say that we see a general decrease in nearly all environmental impact categories as we increase in our circularity rates. Yet, circular economy isn't without its own caveats. Existing literature points out that it is too narrowly focused on material flow and uh, environmental impact, and have neglected the social and economic factors that also play a, view, uh, play a role in creating a sustainable future. However, I will say that these limitations can be overcome, as we see from the Amsterdam business examples. They really push way beyond just reducing environmental impact. They also help to create a vibrant society by creating a new a sustainable social culture through community outreach and communication. They also improve local economy and provide economic opportunities for those in need. So I really believe that with good implementation and a more holistic interpretation of the circular system, it can become a cornerstone of the sustainable future that we are trying to build. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Emily Curdian. I am a student in the Master of Chemical Sciences program within the Biological Concentration. I am also a member of the Joint Collaborative Lab of Dr. Kelly Jordan Shudo and Dr. Judith Grinspin at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I'm here today to tell you a little bit about my research on HIV in the brain and the implications of long-term antiretroviral therapy for patients. Starting with a brief background on HIV, or human immunodeficiency virus, HIV is a retrovirus, meaning that it inserts its copy of an RNA genome into the DNA of a host cell. The virus has infected more than 35 million people worldwide and works to destroy CD4 positive cells and weaken the host's immune system. Thankfully, after years of progress, scientists have developed effective antiretroviral therapies to turn what was once a death sentence into a manageable disease. Antiretroviral therapies, or ART, works to decrease the plasma viral load below the limit of detection, increasing the patient's CD4 count as well as their lifespan. ARTs work to inhibit HIV replication at several different stages of, vi of the viral replication cycle, resulting in several different classes of ARTs, typically <coughs> taken in combination. These classes include nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, or NRTIs, integrase strand inhibitors, and protease inhibitors. Switching gears slightly, I would like to tell you about the neurological component of HIV, as this is something I know a lot of people are not even aware of. HIV can cause a broad spectrum of neurocognitive effects comprised under the HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder umbrella, or HAND. Symptoms increase in severity from asymptomatic cognitive impairment to mild neurocognitive disorder, all the way to HIV-associated dementia. Prior to the CART era, Many patients suffered with HIV-associated dementia, but thankfully its incidence has decreased significantly with treatment with ART. However, other forms of HAND have persisted despite effective viral suppression, and 50% of patients with HIV still develop some form of HAND. To explain how we study the ongoing HAND cases, we need to talk about myelin. In a crash course on neuroscience, neurons communicate with each other by sending electrical signals, these signals originate in the cell body, but travel down long processes called axons. These axons need to be insulated, like electricity in a wire, or the signal is not able to get where it needs to go. 
The insulation for the axon is a sheath composed of a protein called myelin. Now the cells in the brain that produce myelin are called oligodendrocytes. As a matter of fact, what we refer to as the myelin sheath is actually composed of the plasma membrane of this cell called the oligodendrocyte. Now it is important to note that in patients on ART that do develop hand, one of the most persistent pathologies noted is a loss of myelin seen in a thinning of the corpus callosum. This means that even though patients with HIV are taking ART and their viral loads are effectively suppressed, they're still losing white matter and myelin in the brain, and they are still suffering with neurodegeneration. This brings me to the essential question of my lab's research. If white matter loss is continuing despite treatment with ART, is this an effect of latent infection, or could the antiretrovirals themselves be playing a role? For the purposes of today's talk, I want to focus on one antiretroviral in particular, tenofovir alafenamide. Tenofovir alafenamide, or TAF, is a part of the NRTI class, meaning that it inhibits HIV replication by inhibiting an enzyme called HIV reverse transcriptase. Tenofovir alafenamide, or TAF, is a slightly newer antiretroviral and has several clinical uses. It is used in combination with two other antiretrovirals, bictegravir and emtricitabine, in the brand name drug Bictarvi for the treatment of HIV. It is also used in combination with emtricitabine in a form of pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP, to SCOVI, to prevent HIV infection in at-risk individuals. Now, to further study this, oligodendrocytes mature in a well-characterized progression from oligodendrocyte precursor cells, or OPCs, to immature oligodendrocytes, to mature oligodendrocytes. Each of the different forms have specific markers that can be used by scientists to identify the stage and differentiation the cell may be in. A protein called A2B5 is a known marker of OPCs. Galactocerebroside, or gal seed, is a marker of immature oligodendrocytes. And myelin basic protein, MBP, and proteolipid protein, PLP, are markers of mature oligodendrocytes. It is important to note that only mature oligodendrocytes produce myelin, and if something were to inhibit oligodendrocyte differentiation, a loss of myelin would be observed. So our concern and research question is, does ART, or in this case, tenofovir alafenamide, inhibit oligodendrocyte differentiation? To try and answer this question, I used a cell culture model. I grew OPCs on plates, then treated the cells with increasing concentrations of tenofovir alafenamide and allowed them to differentiate for 72 hours. I was then able to look at the markers of differentiations in these cells to determine if TAF caused a decrease in differentiation. Luckily for you guys, using a very high-powered microscope, I was even able to bring some pictures. Here, the blue, or the DAPI staining, represents the total number of cells in culture as it stains nuclei. The green represents GAL-C, the marker of the immature oligodendrocyte. And the red represents PLP, the mature oligodendrocyte. Visually, we can see that cells treated with both the medium and the high doses of TAF have fewer immature and mature oligodendrocytes as compared to our untreated group. And just to point out, the ones on the bottom are our medium and our high doses, as you can see the drastic difference as compared to our untreated group. I repeated this experiment two more times to account for biological variation, and I found that at 0.06 micromolar, the concentration we would normally see used in patients, known as human plasma Cmax, and at 1.7 micromolar, there is a significant reduction in oligodendrocyte differentiation. While this may not seem like good news, studies like these allow us to learn more about why HAND is continuing in patients on ART Studies are ongoing in the Grinspan and Jordan Schuto labs to understand the mechanism by which TAF and other ARTs are inhibiting oligodendrocyte differentiation. The more we learn about these drugs and how they interact with the brain, the easier it will be for us to make these drugs safer for patients. These are life-saving medications, but our job is to make sure they are as safe as possible for the people who need them. Finally, I would like to thank Dr. Jordan Schuto and Dr. Grinspan, as well as all of the members of the Grinspan Lab. I'd like to give a special thank you to Kayla Long, my lab mentor and person who taught me all of the techniques that made this research possible. And lastly, thank you to all of you for listening. <laughs>